Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. Our program will focus on IP rights and data. My name is Richard Asnes, and I'm an intellectual property lawyer focusing on all the non-patent IP rights that exist. We're going to give you a quick overview, very brief overview of the practice groups that are represented here today, and then we'll get on to some administrative matters and then jump right into the program. Our technology transaction practice at Mayor Brown has 50 lawyers worldwide who've done over $200 billion of data, digital, outsourcing, and software transactions. Our intellectual property practice comprises more than 100 IP professionals around the world protecting, preserving, and enforcing the intellectual property rights and assets of the world's most innovative and inventive companies. I want to cover a quick number of administrative matters and then we can jump right into the program. First, at the bottom of your screen, you will notice there are multiple application widgets that you can use. All of these widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. We're streaming this program through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear us. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection, preferably with Chrome or Firefox browsers, and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause any issues. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is, is recommended. If your slides do become behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. If you have any additional questions about technical problems, answers to some of common technical issues are located in the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. During the presentation today, I'll be providing you with an alphanumeric CLE code. If you are applying for CLE credit, you'll need to record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that you received by email with the connection details. You can also get a copy of that sign-in sign sheet in the resource list widget entitled CLA, CLE Affirmation Form. Directions for returning the CLE Affirmation Form are on that sheet. I'll read the code somewhere in the middle of the presentation and then again at the end if you missed it. Please note we've also made the event evaluation form and presentation deck available in the resource list widget. The webinar is being recorded and in a day or so we will send you an email with a link which you can use to listen to it or share it with your colleagues. The recording will also be posted on our website. We hope to have some time at the end for questions. To submit a question you can use the Q&A widget. If we, for some reason, can't get to your question during the we webinar, we'll make every attempt to follow up with you afterwards. So I briefly introduced myself, and next I'll ask Lana and Mark to introduce themselves and take us away on the program. Rich, thank you. My name is Mark Prinsley, and I lead the IP and tech transactions practice of Mayor Brown in the London office. Over the last few years, we've seen issues relating to data, including personal data, taking an increasingly important part uh, in our uh, workload. Thank you, Mark. My name is Lana Corey, and I am an associate in our intellectual property group based in our New York office um, and currently working in our London office. So, so now we would like to dive into the uh, presentation. We live in an era with uh, significant development and investment in businesses which depend on processing and analyzing data and the ability to protect that investment in, in these businesses is generally very important. In theory, without adequate protection, there wouldn't be adequate in investment. So businesses which are investing heavily in this area are businesses which perhaps couldn't even have been dreamed of 20 years ago when the law was last really reshaped in this area. We have uh, autonomous vehicles, facial recognition, and we have sensors uh, going around uh, measuring the use of technology and assets, for example, in, in the world of uh, prop tech. Collecting consumer information has become something everybody is very familiar with, and the uh, enormous fines which regulators have imposed on businesses 
like BA, Marriott, Facebook, and Google on both sides of the Atlantic uh, give an indication of the value of databases which are held by businesses and the value which regulators are placing on um, the rights of individuals whose data is, is being held by those organizations. A couple of data points, perhaps, before we dive into um, the legal detail. Just from um, June this year, Salesforce um, acquired a business called Tableau Software for $15.7 billion. Tableau is a business which is involved in data visualization. It simplifies um, uh, raw data into easily understandable formats like dashboards and worksheets. And interestingly, the CEO of Tableau says, as, and you might say he would say this, of course, that organizations are going to get crushed under the weight of the data which is being produced. Uh, but businesses which can control that data will see brand new opportunities to develop insights and make better decisions. So that's an enormous amount of money for a business which just makes analyzing the data simpler. In the UK, we have a, a, a body called the Royal Society, which has reported on um, data science and the uh, need to create more data scientists just in the UK. So they analyzed uh, job adverts over the last five years, and they have seen... Uh, a general increase in, in jobs over the last five years of 35%. So there are more 35% more vacancies being advertised now than there were five years ago. But of those vacancies, um, they have seen a, uh, a more than 300% increase in the demand for uh, jobs for, for candidates who have got data skills like data scientists and data engineers. So the British economy has a high demand for people with data skills, particularly at the high end of the spectrum, and that must reflect uh, a, a, a change in business. And I don't suppose the UK is frankly any different from, from anywhere else uh, in, in the world. It's just uh, a race to acquire more skills in this area. So considering the importance of um, data and investment in such data, um, how is that data protected? And that's what we aim to discuss today. Um, so today we will be uh, starting with the existing landscape of IP protection available for data, including um, differences in EU rights specific to databases. Uh, we will then discuss how contractual provisions can be a valuable um, asset in protecting data. Uh, and finally, we will share our predictions for uh, IP protection of data going forward. Beginning with types of IP protection for data, uh, current copyright and trade secret laws afford some protection. Uh, we'll start with discussing copyright. Uh, in the United States, copyright protection is governed by the US Copyright Act. Uh, the Copyright Act protects works formed by collection and expression of data. The key is that these collections are selected, coordinated, or arranged in a way that results in an original work. The Copyright Act, however, does not protect ideas that underlie these collections. The key case on databases uh, in the U.S. is the Supreme Court Feist decision. Um, in this case, the Supreme Court held that merely compiling data is insufficient to marry copies merit copyright protection. Rather, selection, coordination, and arrangement of that data must be original to obtain copyright. Following Feist, uh, some databases were found to be subject to, pro to copyright protection as well. In the European Union, um, database protection is governed by the EU database directive which confers copyright protection. Uh, this protection does not extend to the contents of databases, but rather just the database itself. The level of protection um, varies by EU member states. Similar to the US, 
the databases must be original and that by reason of selection or arrangement of the contents constitute the author's own creation. Again, this uh, concept of originality is focused on the selection or arrangement. Under the directive, copyright infringement requires taking of a substantial part of the original, so small elements of data would not be protected necessarily under copyright. Thanks, Lana. I'm going to move on to the other main way that databases can be protected under U.S. law, and that is trade secrets. Trade secrets are a patchwork of state and federal laws. Uh, most states have adopted some version of the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, the UTSA. Others have, very few number have common law trade secret rights. And in 2016, the Defend Trade Secrets Act was passed that in some sense federalized trade secret law. Among other important aspects of the Defend Trade Secrets Act is it allowed federal jurisdiction for trade secrets cases, which very often in the lack of diversity jurisdiction needed to be litigated in state court, but are now almost often, very often and almost always litigated in, in federal court. The Defend Trade Secrets Act adopted a definition of a trade secret that's very similar to the one in the Uniform Trade Secrets Act as well as the common law definitions that it existed. There's really two aspects to trade secret protection. One, this information needs to derive independent economic value by virtue of its secrecy. So it's not just any secret, it's something that has independent value by virtue of its secrecy. And the second aspect is it needs to be subject to reasonable measures to keep such information secret. In other words, you can't claim a, claim a secret in something that you're publishing on your website or that you're giving to third parties not under confidentiality restrictions or other steps that might make your claiming that to be a secret unreasonable. One thing I wanted to point out about that definition that may, that may bear on databases or you may believe bears on databases the definition requires that the information not be readily ascertainable through proper means, which is a reference to what's sometimes called reverse engineering. So if you think of a, of a big database, individual data points in it may be reverse engineerable. In other words, if you have a database of, say, names and addresses that has certain criteria, it may be that you can find certain person's name and address through other sources, but that does not defeat trade secret protection if it would be, in fact, very difficult to recreate the entire database from, from public sources. Databases have been widely recognized by U.S. courts as a form of trade secrets. Customer lists have again and again be re been recognized as trade secrets by the courts. In our case study, we will talk about a customer list database trade secret case. Trade secrets can also be used to cover the methodologies used to gather, select, and refine a database. For example, if the way you collect that data is, is a secret, the process you use to collect it, or even the way you uh, manage or refine the data, all of those things are potentially protectable as trade secrets. But, however, U.S. trade secret law will not never protect against lawful reverse engineering. I wanted to give you a, a quick example of something, how that might work. One uh, recent uh, innovation in big data that's made the news is a company that is able to project retail sales by looking at satellite data of parking lots. So they have a satellite, commercial satellite overflies parts of the United States and looks at, for example, how many cars are parked in the parking lot of that big box retailer and are able to extract from that information fairly decent guesses about retail sales in advance of when those companies might publicly release their sales information. That, that database is in essence a, a trade secret because it has value from its secrecy. You can, for example, jump the market in terms of, of sales announcements. However, if someone had access to the same commercial satellite data, which they did and were able to look at companies reported earning sales from retail locations, you could very, not, not necessarily easily, but could reverse engineer the methods used to collect that data. And trade secret protection would not prevent, 
prevent a competitor from doing that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark to talk about trade secrets in the EU. Thank you, Rich. So in the EU, the protection of trade secrets or confidential information was a um, national uh, matter to be determined at a country by country level. And uh, in recent years, it was determined that it, there would be merit in having a common standard for a, if you like, trade secret to be protected or to be protectable across all the member states of the European Union. And this led to um, the EU Trade Secrets Directive in, in 2016. And the Trade Secrets Directive has been implemented in the domestic law of the member states as of June 2018. So if you're looking at it from a UK perspective, it has certainly been implemented into UK domestic law. And um, if the UK leaves the European Union, um, this EU originated law will remain part of UK domestic law uh, alongside um, the, the existing UK common law and uh, which protects confidential information, which we'll talk about a, a little later. Essentially, the uh, Trade Secrets Directive um, sets minimum standards for uh, something which might be regarded as a trade secret. Um, it must be secret in the sense um, that it, as a body of information, um, it's not generally known or, or readily accessible to people within circles who normally deal with, with that kind of information. It has to have commercial value because of its secrecy, um, all of which seems sort of obvious. Um, but the most interesting uh, element, I think, of the definition is that for it to be a, a trade secret, it isn't sufficient for uh, the owner to say, aha, that is my trade secret. There has to be some. They have, they have to have taken some reasonable steps, some objective steps, which, under the circumstances, uh, mean that you can say um, that, that appropriate steps were taken to keep the information secret. And I think it's in this area that um, we will see uh, challenges to to what is a, what is in fact uh, a, a secret. How. Um, Trade secret will be, will be protected will be something that is determined by um, national law in each of the member states. Um, so how does this uh, uh, new right, this new law relate to data and databases? Well, the good thing is, provided you meet all, all the criteria, um, that it is in fact secret and you're trying to keep it, taking reasonable steps to keep it secret, it will protect um, both the database itself and the underlying um, data. And um, it, it, it means that it, unlike copyright, which uh, doesn't protect um, the taking of insubstantial parts of the original, taking of an insubstantial part of a database would still be a breach of, of, of the trade secret. And that is uh, something where, where you might say the rights under trade secret law are better um, than in copyright. Trade secret, EU trade secret law has been kind of bolted on to existing uh, protections in Europe, both at, both at a European and at a national level. So there is, as Lana mentioned, the database directive, which has some relevance to this, and this sits alongside um, database directive, it also sits alongside uh, the national uh, laws, as I mentioned, which protect uh, confidential information in, in, many, in many countries. And now um, I'd like to hand back to, to Rich. Thanks, Mark. So we put together a chart comparing copyright and trade secrets with respect to database protection, both in the US and in the EU. I would say there's more, more similarities than differences between the U.S. and the EU, both with, with respect to copyright and trade secrets. But there are, in each case, important distinctions between the protections afforded by copyright and the protections afforded by, by trade secret. 
One, one critical difference, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we're talking about projections for the future or guesses about future, is they're very different IP rights in that there's no, no bargain of public disclosure with respect to trade secrets. So both patent law and copyright have elements of public disclosure in, in, in bargain for getting the rights, whereas a trade secret right by its very nature means that companies are not sharing, not sharing those advances. And so there's a, uh, I think, a public policy reason to consider whether databases should merit some sort of forms of protection that would privilege companies to be more, more loose with giving that information to the public. So copyrights require originality in selection, coordination, or arrangement, and that can be a tough test for certain types of databases. Trade secrets, on the other hand, do not require any element of authorship, human authorship, or originality, as long as they are, meet the other requirements for a trade secret. On the copyright side, the economic value and investment is not a consideration for protection. That's what, essentially what the Feist case did away with. It did away with any thought that because you put so much effort into preparing that database, that would somehow bear on whether or not it was original. Trade secrets, in contrast, must have some independent economic value. Copyright is not based on whether or not you've taken reasonable security measures. In fact, in some sense, the whole point of copyright is that you can release that to the public and maintain your rights, whereas a trade secret does require reasonable measures to protect the secrecy of that database. And we'll talk a little bit later about examples of what would be considered reasonable measures. And with respect to copyright, in order to succeed on a copyright claim to the extent you have a database that's subject to that type of protection, you'll likely need to show that a substantial part of the original was copied to constitute excuse me, copyright infringement. With respect to trade secrets, that is not true. Even one important element of a trade secret, if it was procured by unlawful means, could support a claim of trade secret misappropriation. So what about contracts? Contracts are a way we think of, as mentioned in the title of our presentation, a way to sort of mortar over these gaps in the law. There's not really a perfect fit for database protection in terms of IP, but contracts are a way you can legislate with respect to the parties you're dealing with with respect to that data to try to fill in those gaps. It's going to be particularly relevant when you're considering small but very significant pieces of data. Those small pieces of data are going to be impossible to protect by copyright and maybe in some sense harder to protect by trade secrets because even a, a small theft would be uh, decisive for the trade secret in question. So contracts are going to be particularly important there. A couple contract types of contracts to think about. One is employment contracts to bind employees to restrictive covenants. We realize that's not permissible in every state, but certainly in states that will support or enforce reasonable covenants not to compete and other restrictions on employment, certainly something worth considering. The case study we'll talk about actually enforced those types of provisions and it turned out to be a very important aspect of the plaintiff's case there along with the trade secrets claim. And certainly confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements also can protect databases the issue there is that that protection is going to be somewhat limited vis-a-vis -vis third parties that have no reason to know of those contracts or otherwise foreign to those contracts. So the contract will allow you to legislate for effective rights vis-a-vis -vis your third party. They will not, however, give you rights against, against the world, which of course is a big difference between a contractual right and a patent copyright or a copyright right that gives, does give you rights against the world, even to strangers to you. Some of the things we suggest for those types of contracts are specific acknowledgments of the database and the, the rights in that database and the value of that database. We re realize that won't always be possible with respect to form employment agreements, but for example, with respect to specific classes of employees, such as data engineers or other data scientists, you might want to consider specific language getting those employees or contractors for that matter 
to acknowledge rights in your database with particularity. Another potential thing to consider in all of these contracts is anti-reverse engineering clauses. You see those types of provisions in design services contracts, other contracts related to engineering services, but we think it's important to consider those with respect to data agreements as well, or really any confidentiality or NDA that might bear on a database that could be subject to reverse engineering, and in particular could be subject to reverse engineering that would be aided by the type of information you might be required to disclose to them as part of the business relationship. So I mentioned the case study. We've got two of them for you today, one on each side of the pond. The first one we'll talk about is a U.S. case. It's, it's not particularly recent or from, from a higher court, but we thought it was pretty instructive with respect to these issues. The case is Dugan versus American Family Mutual Insurance Company, and like many trade secret cases, it involves employees who became dissatisfied with their employer and went out on their own to start their own insurance uh, agencies. And in this case, what they did is they took customer information of the insurance company's customers and used that information to solicit those customers for new insurance. And, and the backdrop of this factually was that this particular insurance company was having difficulty competing on premium rates in that market. The agents felt like they could do much better with a different insurance company that had a lower, lower risk better risk pool and were able to offer cheaper insurance. And so it was actually, in fact, a pretty damaging move in terms of their ability to poach customers, which is, of course, what led to the lawsuit. However, the, the insurance company here did have non-compete covenants with respect to each of these agents, and the court held it was enforceable on a couple bases. One, it was uh, time-limited, so it was a year-long non-compete. And number two, it was limited in other ways. It did not prohibit them from becoming insurance agents, but just prohibited them from soliciting specific and identifiable customers, namely those customers that they had built a relationship with through their former employee. And there was evidence of record that the company had invested substantially in those agents and their training and the protection of the information at issue. We think this is a good example of how you may need to marry both protection of the database along with specific agreements with those people who have access to that database. In this case, it was employees, but it just as easily could have been contractors who had access to that database. There was also a trade secrets claim in that case. The company claimed that it's, I'll call it a CRM, that isn't what they called it in the decision, but essentially it's sophisticated CRM for its insurance customers was deemed to be a trade secret. And it had more than just names, addresses, and emails, et cetera. It had information about their prior policies, about the types of policies they might be interested in having. It had other qualification data that would have made it useful for someone as an insurance lead generator. So, for example, it had information about income and things of that nature that would be important for underwriting and determining whether it was a decent risk. And the court did find that this database derived independent economic value, and the court noted in particular that it was not just a combination of otherwise publicly available information. So it wasn't just names and addresses and things you might scrape from LinkedIn or the web or what have you, but actually had information that was value-added information about those customers. Moreover, the court held that the company had taken significant steps to keep that information confidential. What one thing we found interesting about this case is that there were actually not explicit confidentiality agreements between the insurance company and its agents. However, there was evidence adduced that the agents would have reasonably understood that the information in the database was a trade secret given the company requirements. Examples of those requirements are taking classes on confidentiality, uh, signing an agreement that they must return company material as well as other property upon their termination. There was a, a culture of confidence around the database. And I think the, the lesson from that is even if you're not in the position to bind all of your employees 
to confidentiality agreements, whether that's because of union issues or what have you, other issues, history, really any reason. You can try to fill that gap by the way you do training and compliance around confidentiality, the way, for example, you mark confidential information, the way you limit access to the database, all of those things can be used as evidence even if you do not have a direct contract with that employee. Although certainly we recommend written agreements as certainly a best practice would have in this case obviated the need probably for this insurance company to prove up all these other steps that they had taken. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to talk a little bit more about the EU. Thank you, Rich. Um, there are a series of differences that I have noticed um, in the course of preparing for this uh, webinar. The first one, perhaps trivial, is that if you have a crack, it seems that in the States you fix it by filling it with mortar, whereas in the UK, if we have a crack, we try and fix it with um, cementing in the crack. The uh, more substantial points of difference, um, perhaps related to trade secrets uh, and protection of data, is in Europe generally we have the first one is we have a we have a more developed law of breach of confidence. Um, the uh, in, in the case study that Rich talked about, it seemed a surprise that certain information was protected in in a sense as a trade secret. In in Europe we have or at least in the UK, we have a, a, a much more well-developed law for the protection of against misuse of confidential information. And as I mentioned earlier, in relation to the Trade Secrets Directive, this sits alongside and isn't, um, isn't uh, removed by uh, the Trade Secrets Directive. It is, it is a complementary right, um, and the scope of breach of confidence is a national matter which you should consider on a case-by-case -case basis. And it seems to me that, that um, it's likely to be of, uh, of some importance in uh, protection of, uh, against misuse of, of, of certain um, databases. Uh, just as um, with breach of trade secrets, the remedy that you will get for breach of confidence will vary from country to country. The um, more substantive right, perhaps more substantive right, um, which uh, may protect databases, is uh, the new right which was created in the EU database directive sitting alongside copyright. And this is called the sui generis or, or database right. And it's there to protect um, uh, creators of database, databases who can demonstrate that they've made um, an adequate investment in um, in the protection of uh, or, or it, it, sorry, in the creation of, of their database, and this uh, purely European law uh, arose in the aftermath of the Feist decision um, in the United States, where European authorities thought that there were similar protection, similar problems in some European countries, not not in fact the UK for the protection of databases which were, you might say, largely the result of, of sweat of the brow, um, and that they needed clearer protection in order to really protect European um, industries. And the right will subsist for um, creators of databases who are nationals or habitual residents of an EU member state. And as you can imagine, um, in the... Um, in the, in, in the circumstances around Brexit, quite what that means for um, database creators who are residents or habitual residents of the United Kingdom and the protection they might get um, has been an issue which has um, exercised a small group of people um, who are concerned about what one of the consequences of Britain's leaving the European Union um, with a, with a no-deal scenario at the end of, of October. So the next question is really, well, what is protected? So a database would be protected um, where the creator has, by some qualitative or quantitative measure, 
made a substantial investment in either obtaining, verifying, or presenting the contents of the database. And I think at the time, people thought that was uh, that meant that any investment in the creation of a database meant that you um, you had a protectable database. And what that protects against is uh, extraction or reutilization of the whole or a substantial part evaluated qualitatively or quantitatively of the contents of a database. And you might say, well, if you look at that, perhaps that is a gives broader protection than the copyright protection, which as Lana mentioned, has to be a reproduction of a substantial part of the original. This is a substantial part evaluated qualitatively or quantitatively. So perhaps uh, if you have a database right, you have uh, protection against um, broader or perhaps smaller elements of the database um, being, being taken. However, no sooner had we got um, a, a database right in Europe or a sui generis right than um, we had a couple of decisions uh, um, which made clear that the database right um, was quite uh, a good deal more limited than people might have thought. It protects, clearly protects the investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the contents of a database, but that doesn't include the investment that a business might make in creating the data, which is then turned into a database. This is kind of the idea expression um, dichotomy from from copyright, perhaps. And there were two cases particularly which um, which demonstrated uh, elements of this. So first, there was a case about fo football fixture lists, um, and these were valuable um, for um, the purposes of um, bookmakers or betting uh, companies who wanted to uh, publish lists of football fixtures so people could bet against the outcome of football matches. Um, and the courts found that the investment in the creation, the investment was in the creation of the league itself as opposed to the presentation of the fixture list. So in other words, determining which teams could be in the league and the rules on how often they played against each other in a season. And, and because the investment was in that and not in the presentation of the fixture list, it was not something in which there had been uh, investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the contents of the database such that you could get a sui generis right for the fixture list. Now, that actually is completely different from what the position would have been under copyright um, in, in the UK. The second case uh, was about, was also about betting, um, was about um, horse, a, a database of were used for horse racing, and whether you, whether you, and when you extracted data to create betting odds for particular races, which bookmakers needed in order to encourage people to bet on the races and to compete against other bookmakers, um, the the extracting of that that data was not extracting a substantial part of the database, either qualitatively or quantitatively. So, even if you had a protectable database. Um, extracting something which was of value in this case uh, failed to be something which was protectable. And so for years, um, there have been hardly any cases, I think, about database rights. Um, and now, uh, because, because I think people thought the protection they afforded was, was pretty narrow, and now we have one which is uh, really a case for the digital era, which is going on in, in the UK courts at, at, the, at this very moment. And it's a dispute between the Ordnance Survey and 77M. Now, the Ordnance Survey is the government body which um, creates maps of um, the United Kingdom and um, licenses, it makes money by selling maps to walkers and people like that, and, and licensing the database is to other um, uh, organizations who then produce other maps 
or other databases incorporating the uh, Ordnance Survey um, data. Matrix was a project, is a product uh, which has been produced by a small company called 77M, um, and that uses uh, data taken from uh, the Ordnance Survey to produce a geospatial uh, map, which uh, I think is extremely valuable. And um, the Ordnance Survey have been trying for some years, by various measures, to stop 77M using data which they say is not licensed. Um, they, they accept that 77M has a license for some data, but says other data is outside the scope of the license. 77M have now got to a position where they are seeking a declaration that the data they are using from the Ordnance Survey is, is not protectable. And they say it's not protectable either in copyright or under the database right. Um, and I assume what they are saying is that in relation to copyright, um, what they take for their geospatial project, product is not a uh, reproduction of a substantial part of the original of the Ordnance Survey map. And that's, um, that's a sort of straightforward factual question which will when we see the judgment it will be clear um, what what their what what that action what what they were actually taking but they're also seeking a declaration that the sui generis uh, right or the database right um, is also not being infringed and this might be particularly interesting because they are presumably arguing that the Ordnance Survey's investment in the creation of the database is in obtaining the data which is being used by the matrix product, not in the presentation, uh, selection, or arrangement of that data, which would be something that they uh, would be able to protect. So take, I think 77M must be arguing that they're taking effectively raw data, uh, not taking a uh, something which is presented, selected, or arranged by, by Ordnance Survey. And there are likely to be uh, many examples of this kind of extraction of, of data um, by digital products. And so this is uh, uh, a very interesting case, which is, which is unfolding um, in, in the English courts at the moment. And um, how is no surprise to say we will be following up and reporting on, on, on what the outcome of that is um, in, in due course. So as uh, we've seen so far, it's important to consider, I'm sorry, it's important to understand how databases fit into the existing legal framework, but it is also important to consider how this framework may evolve. So going forward, IP protection and data will likely require a combination of multiple strategies. Uh, some of these strategies can include altering the structure or content of databases to increase the likelihood of demonstrating creativity or originality. Um, another strategy is increased reliance on contracts, which we expect to be uh, quite popular. And another strategy is to implement safeguards to prevent unauthorized use of proprietary, proprietary databases. And with that, um, I'll pass over to Mark to discuss each of these in turn. So th thank you, Lana. So, so far as um, copyright is concerned, if you want to obtain copyright protection, you should be focusing on the originality of, in the selection, coordination, or arrangement of the database. And um, creating some sort of uh, map of how you've gone in through that would be, would be um, important. I mean, it may be that the database, frankly, isn't capable of much originality, but if you can show some originality, then you increase the chances of, of getting copyright. Uh, it follows uh, from what we've been saying earlier that uh, copyright won't protect, uh, it's very unlikely to protect individual data points because they won't be a substantial part of the original. And um, it's unlikely that the ideas underlying the database uh, would be protected because copyright um, will protect the way um, ideas are expressed, but not the idea, for example, of creating a database of grocery stores in France. Um, it also follows um, 
from um, the Feist decision um, and, and other similar decisions that if you are going to get copyright protection, the copyright protection will be, to use uh, the Supreme Court's uh, language, thin. And I think what they mean by that is that in order for uh, any act to be seen as an infringement of the copyright, it will have to be extremely close to, to the original that has been, uh, that has been copied. If, if there are uh, material differences, then it seems unlikely that the database uh, will be seen to have been infringed. Which takes us on to the second possibility, which is reliance on, on, on copyright. Uh, sorry, reliance on contract. And here we think it's important that um, the contract clarifies ownership of the data. Um, and particularly, this is an issue where you have uh, a database which is being created by machine learning or AI, where there may be some uncertainty about exactly whose data, um, uh, you know, who owns the data. You should contain, you, you, the contract should, should include reasonable restrictions on on uh, what you hope to prevent the other party doing with with the data uh, unreasonable restrictions likely to be struck down frankly on both sides um, of the Atlantic um, the concerns uh, about relying on contract are um, in general it would a contract as rich said would not be binding on on third parties although of course at least in some European countries, we have the concept of uh, rights of third parties. So where contracts are clearly entered for the benefit of third parties, those third parties would be able to rely on the contract even though they are not party to it. The remedies for breach of contract um, might not be what you are hoping for, uh, and that would depend on um, the position in the country in which you or the law under which the, the, the contract has been uh, created. And the mechanics of uh, an enforceable contract um, will obviously be something uh, to be considered as a matter of national law um, in, in, each, in each country. So contract has its uh, drawbacks as well. Um, if you're going to uh, rely on uh, a trade secret, then I think um, it's clear that what you should be focusing on is taking reasonable steps to keep the information secret. That whether it is in fact a secret is something um, that I'm guessing you could be challenged on. But, but if you haven't taken reasonable steps, then it looks like that's a bit of an own goal. And um, steps, that, affirmative steps you could take would be tracking access to the database, reviewing third party agreements for confidentiality, and monitoring the security of the database, so making sure that you've taken reasonable protection. If you haven't done that, um, then it's, it's going to be hard to um, say that the, the database should be protected as a, a trade secret. And with that, I'd like to pass on to, to Rich. Thanks. So one of the things I think you will have gleaned from this today is that there's really not a perfect form of IP protection for databases. It's a, a maybe a combination of factors, trade secret law primarily, strengthened by good contractual protection, and if available, copyright protection. So it's worth thinking about whether or not there are new new ways to attack this or put the potential for new forms of legal protection. Uh, Mark mentioned that the, the European database right was in, in partial response to what happened in, in the Feist case. Uh, however, it hasn't turned out to be a particularly potent form of protection. But it doesn't mean that there can't be an additional try at some form of exclusive property right to really reanimate the sweat of the brow concept to allow people to gain some form of protection when they've invested a lot of money in creating a database. It's also possible that unfair competition laws can be expanded to capture some elements of prohibited conduct Already, if people are using improper means, for example, to reverse engineer or to get those trade secrets, 
certainly possible to bring claims on that basis. It's also possible that there will be amendments to the sui generis right to include, as Mark mentioned, data, for example, produced by, by artificial intelligence. There actually has been, in the past, legislation introduced in the United States, get to the slide, uh, introduced actually in, in, in the 1990s, again, after the Feist decision, and I believe after the EU database directive, that would have created a right. The, the title was misappropriation of collections of information. That ended up not going anywhere in part because of opposition from, from the tech industry. However, since then, since the 1990s, there have been, has been quite a lot of activity with respect to intellectual property reform. That includes the Defend Trade Secrets Act, the America Invents Act, most recently the Music Modernization Act, which impacted copyright law. Right now in Congress, patent reform is, is under consideration as well as additional copyright changes. So the pace of, since the seminal um, copyright patent and trademark laws were passed in the United States between the 1950s and the 1970s, there has been an acceleration of legislation in the IP area. So it's certainly possible that there will be additional efforts to protect databases. And I think it goes hand in hand with trying to protect, at least in the United States, what we view as our core innovations. So for example, there's been a lot of activity and consideration of, are we doing enough on the patent side to protect what amounts to technological advancements like artificial intelligence or other internet software, you might call them, related, related inventions, given that that is one of the U.S. technical advantages vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis other countries. And so it's certainly possible, particularly if the tech industry would get behind it, that there could be an, a new push towards a unique database right in the United States that would help fill in the gaps that exist in copyright law as well as allow it to be a right that did not need to be kept secret. I think there's a public policy argument for a right that promotes the disclosure and use of those databases along with a bargain for additional rights, making some potential sense. And we're gonna ask, I think, either Lana or Mark to talk about um, the sui generis right. Thanks, Rich. Um, as Rich mentioned, uh, the current framework isn't perfect to protect databases. Um, and with that, last year, um, sorry, and that includes the, the database directive. Uh, last year, the European Commission released a staff working document which provided the results of an evaluation of the database directive to see how effective it's been um, in protecting databases. Uh, the document reported that the sui generis right is not as effective as expected, um, but however, the Commission is not recommending to do away with it just yet, um, as it recognized that the sui generis right provides an added layer of protection, particularly against third parties. So there may be some amendments to it to try to bolster its effectiveness, but at this point, uh, it, it does seem that the Commission recognizes uh, it's not doing the best that it could. Thank you. So we, we got a couple of great questions, which I will, will read for everyone and then answer. We actually got two questions that, unbeknownst to the askers, were in some sense interrelated. Um, the first question was, can a party restrict use of data by contract when the data is not secret? I'm finding more and more that parties are trying to restrict use of data that my company may obtain over the course of our relationship. And I got a second question. We, we got a second question which is, which is related in a way, and that question was, I'd be keen to hear your view of whether market data licensed by stock exchanges, um, I understand individual data points, prices of stock traded on an exchange are not subject to copyright. However, exchanges nowadays claim that creating derived products using their prices require a derived data license. So those, I think those two questions are related in that you might take the view that the stock exchanges are attempting to protect something that isn't secret and requiring uh, additional payment for derived use of that non-secret data. In fact, 
in this instance, is we're, we're talking about market data, market data that's probably by, by its nature public. So I'll try to answer those questions together, and then Mark and Lana, I'll turn it over to you for, for an EU perspective. I, I think that contract can create rights that are broader than rights that are ex available under the intellectual property rules. And, and contracts, I think, do that all the time. So in other words, if, if the data exchange, if the data exchange, excuse me, the stock exchange has some information you need from them that you can't get elsewhere, an example would be you need real-time data that's not available anywhere else, or um, you need uh, back-end data that's not available to the public, they can, but, but they can use that leverage to bind you to terms that they would not otherwise have the right to bind you through through intellectual property law. So I think the answer to the first question, can you protect data that's not secret, the answer I believe is yes. And moreover, I think that the, the exchanges based on their bargaining position in some ways can prevent you from using derived, data that's derived from data you get from them or at least requiring you to pay a fee to 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 use that data. So, Mark, any other thoughts on those? Mark or Lana? So that, that, that actually is very similar to the experience that we have in in the UK, looking at, at these kind of uh, arrangements. That you, in a sense, you are ending up in contract um, agreeing to restrictions for data, which, uh, in some senses. In some limited senses, might might actually be public, but it, it isn't really public at the time you you get the data under the under the, under the data license. Um, and there are there are also I've noticed um, there are issues around attribution uh, of the data. So it is important when you use the data to say where it's come from, and um, and that's something that you you may need a you may also need a, a license for as well. So that they they try hard, and I think they succeed in in showing uh, in creating uh, enforceable contracts to protect um, to protect data which you might say was public. But I mean, I think you'd have to look at each case uh, individually. <laughs> We have, we have an additional question, another good one. Uh, can you address the notion often found in contracts of, quote, ownership of data for raw, factual, functional data? Is the concept proper? Should it be dealt differently than a property claim? That's, that's a fabulous question. I, I think, in fact, during this webinar, you may have heard Mark talk about ownership of data, uh, and I think it's something that you see used as shorthand all the time in conversations and negotiations, one business person will say to another, oh, but we need to own the data. And then they go back to their lawyers and say, make sure we own the data. And we've had debates internally about whether that shorthand makes sense in a legal contract and whether or not the concept of quote unquote ownership of data really makes sense when it's not something that is generally protected by a recognized intangible that you can say someone owns. So when someone comes to you and says, I want to own the trademark, you say, okay, great, we'll file a trademark in the company's name, or I want to own a patent. Well, okay, we'll get it assigned from the inventors and we'll file it in the company's name. I'll register a copyright in the company's name. Those are all tangibles that you can say you own. And even for unregistered intangibles, you can say that. You can say, we own this know-how about this manufacturing process or this know-how for this trading algorithm. With respect to data, I think it's, it's harder to use that language, and my feeling is it tends to trip up negotiations with business teams when they're fighting over who, quote unquote, owns it, when what really matters is who has the right to use that data, in what ways, what rights do they have to sublicense it, what rights do they have to make derived use of it, what rights do they have to disclose it. So my, my personal view is that talking about ownership of data is, is in some ways a useful shorthand and in other ways a red herring that can lead particularly business-to-business -business negotiations to kind of go down blind alleys. But let me get Mark and Lana's views on that from, from their practices. So, so I think it's a very interesting um, uh, point, but I think that if you, I think there is a difference between somebody who has acquired data rather like the, 
you know, the Ordnance Survey, you know, anybody could go out and make a map of the city of London. It just happens that Ordnance Survey have done it. doesn't mean that they own that data because anybody else could go and create that data independently. But uh, in a way, they own their expression of the data. But if they have created their own data, you know, like the, um, the football league that creates its league of football teams, then I think it's not unreasonable to say that sort of data can be owned by somebody who who creates it. Um, I think that, um, th that the real issue is, though, as, as Rich said, what rights somebody has to use the data. And, and that's probably where the um, effort should be focused. And, and it probably is essentially a question of contract. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, that wraps it up. We did want to highlight for you a couple upcoming webinars. Give me one second to get to the slide. Uh, and that is on September 12th, we're hosting a webinar on managing IP in joint ventures and collaboration agreements. And on Tuesday, November 5th, we're hosting a webinar on contracting for digital platform relationships. Invites for both of those will be forthcoming. Um, that wraps up today's program. On behalf of Mayor Brown and my colleagues, thank you for your time, and thank you in particular for those really, really great questions. We all hope you found this uh, program very useful. Final housekeeping items, a recording and link to the materials from this program will be distributed by email in the next day or two. For those applying for CLE credit, please note the certificates of attendance will be distributed within 30 days of today's date. And we're always looking to find new topics you're interested in, in hearing about. The email to obtain, uh, submit those ideas is techtransactions, all one word, at mayorbrown.com. And thank you very much for participating.